How was the connection between electricity and magnetism discovered? The close connection between electric current and magnetic fields was discovered quite by accident. In 1820, Danish physicist Hans Christian Ørsted, 1777-1851 gave a lecture on the heating effects of an electric current on a wire. A compass happened to be near the wire and he was surprised to see the compass rotate when the current was on. He had been looking for connections between electricity and magnetism for several years but expected that the compass would point away from the wire. Instead he found that the compass pointed in a circle around the wire. Above the wire it pointed perpendicular to the wire. Below the wire it also pointed in the perpendicular, but in the opposite direction. What causes the flow of charges in a voltaic pile? Volta invented the term electromotive force, EMF, to describe what causes the separation of charges. The more disks there were in the voltaic pile, the greater the EMF. Unfortunately, the word force is an incorrect use of that term. Because there is no mechanical push, measured in newtons, on the charge. The correct term is potential difference or voltage, the energy change per unit charge separated. Both the term voltage and the unit in which it is measured, the volt, V, are named after Volta. How did Dalton represent atoms? Dalton used pictographs to represent atoms. Below, in the first line, are some examples. Dalton would represent a chemical reaction. Carbon plus 2 oxygen to yield carbon dioxide, as shown on the second line below. How is Earth's magnetic field oriented? Because opposite poles attract. The north pole of a hanging magnet or compass must point toward a south pole. So, the south pole of Earth's magnet must be near the north geographic pole. The poles are actually far below Earth's surface, so Earth's field is not parallel to its surface. What is Ohm's law? In the early 1800s, George Simon Ohm, 1789-1854, a German physicist, developed the law that bears his name, the resistance of an object is independent of current through it. Many materials do not obey Ohm's law. For example, when the current through the tungsten filament wire in a lamp is increased the temperature of the wire increases and so does its resistance.
How then could atoms last billions of years? Rutherford offered no answer. In addition, as the electron spiraled into the nucleus it would create a smear of all colors of light. But hydrogen was known to produce only specific colors, called an emission line spectrum. What is potential difference or voltage? In a voltaic pile, today more commonly called a battery. Chemical energy is converted into increased energy of electric charges. Positive charges at the positive terminal of the battery have a greater energy than those at the negative terminal. The quantity that is important is not the total energy difference of charges at the two terminals of the battery. But the energy difference divided by the charge. This quantity is called the electric potential difference, or more commonly, the voltage. What discovery did James Clerk Maxwell make that depended on the work of Ersted, Faraday, and Ampere? In an earlier chapter we have seen that charges create electric fields. In this chapter we have seen that moving charges, that is, currents. Create magnetic fields and that changing magnetic fields produce electric fields. In the 1860s, Scottish physicist James Clerk Maxwell, 1831 to 1879, added a crucial additional connection. Changing electric fields can produce magnetic fields. With that idea, Maxwell recognized that these relationships meant that electric and magnetic fields could move through space. The fields move through space as transverse waves that are perpendicular to each other. Maxwell calculated the speed and found that it was equal to the speed of light. He published his results in 1864 and a textbook on electromagnetism in 1873. In 1881 Oliver Habeside wrote Maxwell's famous four equations in the form they are used today. In 1888 Heinrich Hertz, 1857-1894, transmit electromagnetic waves across his laboratory. Confirming Maxwell's theoretical work. What were the implications of Ersted's discovery? The fact that moving charge in a wire could create a magnetic field created a great deal of excitement and enthusiasm in the scientific community. A week after hearing about Ohr's Ted's discovery, French physicist and mathematician André-Marie Ampere 1775-1836 gave a presentation at the French Academy of Sciences that extended Ohr's Ted's experiments and contained detailed analyses. A day later he found that two parallel current carrying wires would either attract or repel each other depending on the relative directions of the currents. Amper's greatest contribution, however, 
was the mathematical theory he created for electricity and magnetism. British chemist and physicist Michael Faraday's 1791-1867, philosophy led him to search for connections between phenomena like electricity, magnetism, and light. In 1821 he invented what is now called a homopolar motor. One end of a wire was suspended from a support so that it could swing in any direction. The other end of the wire contacted a pool of mercury. When Faraday put current through the wire the end in the mercury traced out a circle. The force that Faraday had observed wasn't formalized until 1891 and then by the Dutch physicist Hendrik Antoon Lorentz, 1853-1928. called the Lorentz force law is proportional to the current through the wire, the magnetic field, and the length of the wire. The force, which is perpendicular to both the current and the magnetic field, is strongest when the current and field are at right angles. This force is the basis of motors and many other applications. When Faraday published his results he failed to give credit to two other important scientists and he was given assignments to work in other fields. Nevertheless he continued to do experiments on the effects of magnetic fields. For example, he found that when dense glass was put in a magnetic field, the direction of polarization of light going through the glass was rotated. He spent 10 years searching for ways to create a current from a magnetic field. Finally, in 1831 he tried changing the magnetic field and made the crucial discovery that an electric current is produced by a changing magnetic field. The current a flow of charges, is produced by an electric field exerting forces on the charges. Faraday went on to invent the dynamo, an early electric generator. The American high school physics teacher Joseph Henry 1797-1878, made the discovery at almost the same time. In what ways do atoms emit and absorb light? In the mid-1800s Robert Kirchhoff published three laws that describe how materials emit and absorb light. 1. A hot solid or a hot, dense gas produces a continuous spectrum. 2. A hot, Low-density gas produces an emission line spectrum. 3. A continuous spectrum source viewed through a cool. Low-density gas produces an absorption line spectrum. In what ways do atoms emit and absorb light? In the mid-1800s Robert Kirchhoff published three laws that describe how materials emit and absorb light. 1. A hot solid or a hot, dense gas produces a continuous spectrum. 2. A hot, low-density gas produces an emission line spectrum. 3. A continuous spectrum source viewed through a cool. Low density gas produces an absorption line spectrum.
What is a spectrum and what are continuous and line spectra? Newton showed that when white light is passed through a prism it is split into a spectrum of all colors from violet through red. There were no gaps between the colors, so the spectrum is called continuous. The emission line of sodium has only two yellow lines. Hydrogen has four lines. The spectrum of iron, on the other hand, has an extremely large number of lines. An absorption line spectrum occurs when the low density gas absorbs distinct colors, leaving dark gaps in the otherwise continuous spectrum. For example, the spectrum that the German physicist Joseph von Fraunhofer 1787 to 1826 took of the spectrum of the sun in 1814 showed 574 dark lines. In 1859 they were explained as being absorption lines from the cooler gases in the sun's atmosphere. Fraunhofer made the best optical glass of any glassmaker of his era. He made great improvements to the achromatic lens, which refracts light of all colors the same amount. Like most glassmakers of his era, he died young. Most likely from the poisonous effects of the materials used to make the glass. What is a spectrum and what are continuous and line spectra? Newton showed that when white light is passed through a prism it is split into a spectrum of all colors from violet through red. There were no gaps between the colors, so the spectrum is called continuous. The emission line of sodium has only two yellow lines. Hydrogen has four lines. The spectrum of iron, on the other hand, has an extremely large number of lines. An absorption line spectrum occurs when the low density gas absorbs distinct colors, leaving dark gaps in the otherwise continuous spectrum. For example, the spectrum that the German physicist Joseph von Fraunhofer 1787 to 1826, took of the spectrum of the sun in 1814 showed 574 dark lines. In 1859 they were explained as being absorption lines from the cooler gases in the sun's atmosphere. Fraunhofer made the best optical glass of any glassmaker of his era. He made great improvements to the achromatic lens, which refracts light of all colors the same amount. Like most glassmakers of his era, he died young. Most likely from the poisonous effects of the materials used to make the glass. How can the emission and absorption of light by atoms be explained? In 1911 Niels Bohr, 1885 to 1962, a Dane who recently had received his Ph.D. from the University of Copenhagen, joined Rutherford at Cambridge University. He quickly began work on the Rutherford model. He published his results in 1913, basing them on three postulates. One electrons only move in certain allowed orbits at discrete radii and with specific energies. 
that is, their radii and energies are quantized. When in these orbits their radii and energies are constant. The atoms do not emit or absorb radiation. Two electrons gain or lose energy when they jump from one allowed orbit to another. Then they emit or absorb light with a frequency given by HF equals E2, EI where E2 and EI are the energies of the electrons in the allowed orbits. The constant H is called Planck's constant, 6.6 x 10 to 34 J slash hertz, joules per hertz. 3. The correspondence principle. When the electron is very far away from the nucleus classical physics must give the same answer as the new quantum physics. He later changed the third postulate from the correspondence principle to requiring that the angular momentum of the electron be quantized, that is proportional to an integer called the quantum number. The results didn't change, but the derivation of them was more straightforward. This method is presented in almost every textbook. The two drawings below illustrate the emission of light when the electron goes from a higher energy to a lower energy orbit and the absorption of light when the electron's energy is increased. In 1885 Johann Balmer had found a formula that accurately calculated the wavelengths of the visible hydrogen spectrum. It was purely empirical that is, there was no physics-based explanation of it. In 1888 Jana Rydberg generalized Balmer's results to allow Calculation of hydrogen emission in the ultraviolet and infrared. Bauer was able to explain Balmer's and Rydberg's formulae using the results of his postulates. The equation for the wavelength of the emitted radiation is 1 slash x equals r, i slash m2, 1 slash n2. The numbers m and n are the quantum numbers of the two energy levels. For example, the red line would have m equals 2, n equals 3. The constant r is 0.01097 nm1, making the wavelength of the red line 1 slash, 0.01097, v4, 1 9th, nm1, equals 656.3 nanometers, in excellent agreement with the experiment. Thus Bower's model is a major advance in understanding the structure of the atom. How can the emission and absorption of light by atoms be explained? In 1911 Niels Bower 1885 to 1962, a Dane who recently had received his Ph. D from the University of Copenhagen, joined Rutherford at Cambridge University. He quickly began work on the Rutherford model. He published his results in 1913, basing them on three postulates. One electrons only move in certain allowed orbits at discrete radii and with specific energies. That is, their radii and energies are quantized. When in these orbits their radii and energies are constant. The atoms do not emit or absorb radiation. Two electrons gain or lose energy when they jump from one allowed orbit to another. Then they emit or absorb light with a frequency given by HF equals E2, EI where 
E2 and EI are the energies of the electrons in the allowed orbits. The constant H is called Planck's constant, 6.6 x 10 to 34 J slash hertz, joules per hertz. 3. The correspondence principle. When the electron is very far away from the nucleus classical physics must give the same answer as the new quantum physics. He later changed the third postulate from the correspondence principle to requiring that the angular momentum of the electron be quantized, that is proportional to an integer called the quantum number. The results didn't change, but the derivation of them was more straightforward. This method is presented in almost every textbook. The two drawings below illustrate the emission of light when the electron goes from a higher energy to a lower energy orbit and the absorption of light when the electron's energy is increased. In 1885 Johann Balmer had found a formula that accurately calculated the wavelengths of the visible hydrogen spectrum. It was purely empirical that is, there was no physics-based explanation of it. In 1888 Jana Rydberg generalized Balmer's results to allow calculation of hydrogen emission in the ultraviolet and infrared. Bauer was able to explain Balmer's and Rydberg's formulae using the results of his postulates. The equation for the wavelength of the emitted radiation is 1 slash x equals r, i slash m2, 1 slash n2. The numbers m and n are the quantum numbers of the two energy levels. For example, the red line would have m equals 2, n equals 3. The constant r is 0.01097 nm1, making the wavelength of the red line 1 slash, 0.01097, v4, 1 ninth, nm1, equals 656.3 nanometers, in excellent agreement with the experiment. Thus Bower's model is a major advance in understanding the structure of the atom. Is light a wave or a particle? Light, and other forms of electromagnetic radiation, has the properties of both a particle and a wave. As a wave it is described by its wavelength, frequency, amplitude, and polarization. It has the ability to diffract and interfere. As a particle it has energy, momentum, and angular momentum. It has the ability to be emitted and absorbed. And to scatter off other particles, transferring energy and momentum. In some experiments it acts like a wave in part of the experiment and a particle in other parts. For example, if you put a beam of light through a pair of narrow, closely spaced slits. The so-called Young two-slit experiment, you get an interference pattern with alternating stripes of light. Where the light through the two slits constructively interferes, and darkness where the interference is destructive. If you now greatly reduce the intensity of the light and use a detector that can detect individual photons you will have regions where a large number of photons arrive and others where none arrive. The regions are exactly where the dark and light stripes were. If the intensity is so low that there is only one photon in the 
apparatus at a time how can the dark and light regions be understood? Particles can't split, with half going through one slit. Half through the other so the two halves interfere. If you try to modify the experiment so you can tell through. Which slit the photon came you destroy the interference pattern. Physicists have grappled with this mystery for decades. There are no. Easy explanations. Perhaps the fault lies with our language and thinking. We simply do not have the correct words or mental concepts to describe and understand how light works. Is light a wave or a particle? Light and other forms of electromagnetic radiation, has the properties of both a particle and a wave. As a wave it is described by its wavelength, frequency, amplitude, and polarization. It has the ability to diffract and interfere. As a particle it has energy, momentum, and angular momentum. It has the ability to be emitted and absorbed. And to scatter off other particles, transferring energy and momentum. In some experiments it acts like a wave in part of the experiment and a particle in other parts. For example, if you put a beam of light through a pair of narrow, closely spaced slits. The so-called Young 2 slit experiment, you get an interference pattern with alternating stripes of light. Where the light through the two slits constructively interferes, and darkness where the interference is destructive. If you now greatly reduce the intensity of the light and use a detector that can detect individual photons you will have regions where a large number of photons arrive and others where none arrive. The regions are exactly where the dark and light stripes were. If the intensity is so low that there is only one photon in the apparatus at a time how can the dark and light regions be understood? Particles can't split, with half going through one slit. Half through the other so the two halves interfere. If you try to modify the experiment so you can tell through. Which slit the photon came you destroy the interference pattern. Physicists have grappled with this mystery for decades. There are no. Easy explanations. Perhaps the fault lies with our language and thinking. We simply do not have the correct words or mental concepts to describe and understand how light works. Does light interact with an atom as a wave or a particle? A wave carries energy continuously over time. The more energy in the wave, the faster the energy is transferred. A particle, on the other hand, delivers its energy all at once. When an atom either absorbs or emits light, the transfer is almost instantaneous. Therefore light interacts with an atom like a particle. The idea that light comes in packets of energy was first stated by Albert Einstein. 1879-1955, in 1905.
He called the packet a light quantum. The quantum was given the name photon in 1926. The photon has no mass or charge. But it does carry angular momentum. It always moves at the speed of light, see. Each photon carries an amount of energy E equals HF, where Fis its frequency. Therefore a photon of blue light has more energy than one of red light. The energy carried by a beam of light depends both on the frequency and the number of photons per second leaving the source. Does light interact with an atom as a wave or a particle? A wave carries energy continuously over time. The more energy in the wave, the faster the energy is transferred. A particle, on the other hand, delivers its energy all at once. When an atom either absorbs or emits light, the transfer is almost instantaneous. Therefore light interacts with an atom like a particle. The idea that light comes in packets of energy was first stated by Albert Einstein. 1879-1955, in 1905. He called the packet a light quantum. The quantum was given the name photon in 1926. The photon has no mass or charge. But it does carry angular momentum. It always moves at the speed of light, see. Each photon carries an amount of energy E equals HF, where Fis its frequency. Therefore a photon of blue light has more energy than one of red light. The energy carried by a beam of light depends both on the frequency and the number of photons per second leaving the source. Are emission and absorption the only ways light interacts with an atom? In 1917 Albert Einstein proposed a third way light could interact with an atom. If a photon with the correct energy struck an atom in the excited state then the atom would be stimulated to emit an additional photon and drop to the lower energy level. The two photons leave with the same energy, in terms of a wave same wavelength, and in phase. Are emission and absorption the only ways light interacts with an atom? In 1917 Albert Einstein proposed a third way light could interact with an atom. If a photon with the correct energy struck an atom in the excited state then the atom would be stimulated to emit an additional photon and drop to the lower energy level. The two photons leave with the same energy, in terms of a wave same wavelength, and in phase. What are the limits of the Bohr model? Today's model is totally different from Bohr's 1913 model. Bohr's model could explain only the spectra of hydrogen and helium from which an electron was removed. 
with some modifications is could also explain the spectra of the alkalis like lithium. From 1913 through 1926 physicists tried to extend the model, with some successes. But the lack of a physics-based explanation of the postulates led to Research aimed at a model that was not based on classical ideas like Bowers. One of the first steps was taken by the young German physicist Werner Heisenberg, 1901-1976. What are the limits of the Bohr model? Today's model is totally different from Bower's 1913 model. Bower's model could explain only the spectra of hydrogen and helium from which an electron was removed. With some modifications is could also explain the spectra of the alkalis like lithium. From 1913 through 1926 physicists tried to extend the model, with some successes. But the lack of a physics-based explanation of the postulates led to Research aimed at a model that was not based on classical ideas like Bowers. One of the first steps was taken by the young German physicist Werner Heisenberg, 1901-1976. What were some of Niels Bohr's accomplishments as an exemplary physicist and citizen? Bohr returned to the University of Copenhagen as a professor of physics in 1921. With the help of the government and the Carlsberg Beer Foundation he established the Institute of Theoretical Physics. Bohr's Institute attracted all the major theoretical physicists from around the world for short visits or extended appointments. When the Germans occupied Denmark, Bohr made a daring escape. First to Sweden, then England, then the United States. He was a consultant in the atomic bomb development effort, but after the war he tried to get President Harry Truman. 1884 to 1972, and British leader Winston Churchill, 1874 to 1965, to agree to share the secrets of the bomb with all countries. Including the Soviet Union. They both rejected Bohr's proposal. But after the Soviets developed the bomb, Bohr's ideas helped found the United Nations International Atomic Energy Agency. Until his death in 1962 he worked to reduce the threat of a nuclear war. In the centenary of his birth Denmark issued a postal stamp showing Bohr and his wife, Margarethe. What were some of Niels Bohr's accomplishments as an exemplary physicist and citizen? Bohr returned to the University of Copenhagen as a professor of physics in 1921. With the help of the government and the Carlsberg Beer Foundation he established the Institute of Theoretical Physics. Bohr's Institute attracted all the major theoretical physicists from around the world for short visits or extended appointments. When the Germans occupied Denmark, Bohr made a daring escape. First to Sweden, then England, then the United States. 
he was a consultant in the atomic bomb development effort, but after the war he tried to get President Harry Truman. 1884-1972, and British leader Winston Churchill, 1874-1965, to agree to share the secrets of the bomb with all countries. Including the Soviet Union. They both rejected Boer's proposal. But after the Soviets developed the bomb. Boer's ideas helped found the United Nations International Atomic Energy Agency. Until his death in 1962 he worked to reduce the threat of a nuclear war. In the centenary of his birth Denmark issued a postal stamp showing Boer and his wife, Margarethe. What is the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle? Heisenberg, together with Max Born and Pakal Jordan. Tried a totally different approach using mathematical matrices. As part of their work Heisenberg developed a principle that demonstrates that in the atomic world our knowledge is limited. The uncertainty principle is written as Axe APS equals H slash 4N. In words, the uncertainty of a particle's position times the uncertainty in its momentum is never less than Planck's constant divided by 4n. If it has a precise location, then its momentum and thus its speed, measured at the same time, must be imprecise. Planck's constant is extremely small. And so the uncertainty principle is important only for objects the size of atoms or smaller. The position and momentum of a baseball, for example, can both be precisely known at the same time. The uncertainty principle shows why Bohr's electron orbits cannot exist. If you know the radius of the circle precisely then it must have some velocity along the radius smearing out its orbit. The uncertainty principle also exists in a form linking energy and time. In this form it says that if an electron is in a state that lasts for only a short time, then its energy is not precisely defined. What is the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle? Heisenberg, together with Max Born and Pakal Jordan, tried a totally different approach using mathematical matrices. As part of their work Heisenberg developed a principle that demonstrates that in the atomic world our knowledge is limited. The uncertainty principle is written as Axe APS equals H slash 4N. In words, the uncertainty of a particle's position times the uncertainty in its momentum is never less than Planck's constant divided by 4N. If it has a precise location, then its momentum and thus its speed, measured at the same time, must be imprecise. Planck's constant is extremely small and so the uncertainty principle is important only for objects the size of atoms or smaller. The position and momentum of a baseball, for example, can both be precisely known at the same time. 
the uncertainty principle shows why Bohr's electron orbits cannot exist. If you know the radius of the circle precisely, then it must have some velocity along the radius smearing out its orbit. The uncertainty principle also exists in a form linking energy and time. In this form it says that if an electron is in a state that lasts for only a short time, then its energy is not precisely defined. How did probability rather than certainty enter into the model for the atom? In 1926 the Austrian physicist Erwin Schrödinger, 1887-1961 published an equation for a wave function that describes the probability of finding an electron at a particular position. It agrees with Bohr's model in that the most probable radius for an electron is that given by the Bohr model. And the energy of the electron is the same as Bohr calculated. But its results are fundamentally different. The solution of Schrödinger's equation can be shown as a probability. Cloud that shows the most probable locations for the electron. The n equals 1 state of the hydrogen atom is small and spherical. There are two n equals. Two states. The s state has angular momentum 0 and another spherically symmetric cloud. The p state, with angular momentum 1 has two most probable locations, the top and bottom. The n equals 3 state has three possible angular momenta, 0, 1, and 2 the d state. With angular momentum equals 2, has four angular regions with high probability. Red light is emitted when the electron goes from the n equals 3 p state to the n equals 2 s state. The lifetime of the higher energy state is very short, less than one billionth of a second. So when many atoms emit the light, the energy they emit is spread out. The energy from any particular atom cannot be precisely predicted. How did probability rather than certainty enter into the model for the atom? In 1926 the Austrian physicist Erwin Schrödinger, 1887-1961 published an equation for a wave function that describes the probability of finding an electron at a particular position. It agrees with Bohr's model in that the most probable radius for an electron is that given by the Bohr model. And the energy of the electron is the same as Bohr calculated. But its results are fundamentally different. The solution of Schrödinger's equation can be shown as a probability. Cloud that shows the most probable locations for the electron. The n equals 1 state of the hydrogen atom is small and spherical. There are two n equals. Two states. The s state has angular momentum 0 and another spherically symmetric cloud. The p state, with angular momentum 1 has two most probable locations, the top and bottom. The n equals 3 state has three possible angular momenta, 0, 1, and 2 the d state. With angular momentum equals 2, has four angular regions with high probability. 
red light is emitted when the electron goes from the n equals 3p state to the n equals 2s state. The lifetime of the higher energy state is very short, less than one billionth of a second. So when many atoms emit the light, the energy they emit is spread out. The energy from any particular atom cannot be precisely predicted. Are electrons waves or particles? The electrons in an atom are not confined to one region of space, but are spread out. They are acting more like waves than particles. In Louis de Broglie's 1892-1987-1924 doctoral thesis he proposed that electrons behave like waves with a wavelength given by x equals h slash mv. Where h is Planck's constant, and m and v the mass and velocity of the electron. The thesis was forwarded to Einstein, who enthusiastic ally endorsed the idea and recommended that the thesis be approved. De Broglie was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1929 for this work. The de Broglie wavelength is associated with any particle. Although for an object the size of a baseball it is much smaller than the diameter of a nucleus. The de Broglie wavelength of a particle determines its wave-like properties. Just as light photons interfere with themselves in a two-slit experiment, so do particles. The interference of electrons, atoms, and even molecules as large as C60, so-called buckyballs. Has been observed, and the measurements fit de Broglie's wavelength perfectly. So, both matter and light can act like either a particle or a wave. This phenomenon is given the name wave particle duality. Are electrons waves or particles? The electrons in an atom are not confined to one region of space, but are spread out. They are acting more like waves than particles. In Louis de Broglie's 1892-1987-1924 doctoral thesis he proposed that electrons behave like waves with a wavelength given by x equals h slash mv. Where h is Planck's constant, and m and v the mass and velocity of the electron. The thesis was forwarded to Einstein, who enthusiastic ally endorsed the idea and recommended that the thesis be approved. De Broglie was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1929 for this work. The de Broglie wavelength is associated with any particle. Although for an object the size of a baseball it is much smaller than the diameter of a nucleus. The de Broglie wavelength of a particle determines its wave-like properties. Just as light photons interfere with themselves in a two-slit experiment, so do particles. The interference of electrons, atoms, and even molecules as large as C60, so-called buckyballs. Has been observed, and the measurements fit de Broglie's wavelength perfectly. So, both matter and light can act like either a particle or a wave. This phenomenon is given the name wave particle duality.
Where do X-rays come from? X-rays are electromagnetic waves of very short wavelength. Alternatively, they are very high energy photons. They are emitted by atoms with many electrons, such as those high in the periodic table. The more electrons, the greater the charge of the nucleus. And the higher the energy of the electrons that are close to the nucleus, with n equals 1 or 2. Therefore, when the atom is disturbed, as it is in an X-ray tube when the anode is bombarded by high-energy electrons. One of the N equals 1 electrons can be kicked out. When an N equals 2 electron loses energy and takes the place of the kicked out electron, an X-ray is emitted. Where do X-rays come from? X-rays are electromagnetic waves of very short wavelength. Alternatively, they are very high energy photons. They are emitted by atoms with many electrons, such as those high in the periodic table. The more electrons, the greater the charge of the nucleus. And the higher the energy of the electrons that are close to the nucleus, with n equals 1 or 2. Therefore, when the atom is disturbed, as it is in an X-ray tube when the anode is bombarded by high-energy electrons. One of the n equals 1 electrons can be kicked out. When an N equals 2 electron loses energy and takes the place of the kicked out electron, an X-ray is emitted. Why don't birds or squirrels on power lines get electrocuted? In order to get electrocuted on a bare wire, a bird would have to be in contact with objects that had two different voltages. The difference in voltage along the wire over the distance between the animal's feet is very small. The animal would be in danger only if it made contact with both a High voltage wire and the ground or a wire connected to ground, low voltage. Then there could be a large current through its body. Why aren't the Van Allen belts present around the North and South Poles? At the equator, the magnetic field is parallel to the ground and the electrons. And protons from the solar wind can become trapped around the field lines. At the poles, however, the magnetic field strengthens, the lines become closer together. And forces on the particles push them back toward the equator. Some of the most energetic particles are able to penetrate the atmosphere where they interact. With oxygen and nitrogen atoms producing the natural light shows that are called auroras. What levels of current are dangerous?
approximately 1 ma, 0.001a, is enough to produce a tingling sensation. 10 ma is painful. 12 to 20 ma is enough to paralyze muscles, making it impossible to let go. 60 to 100 ma causes ventricular fibrillation of the heart. That is, the heart is beating in such a way that it cannot pump blood through the circulatory system. Greater than 200 ma causes the heart to clamp down and stop beating. Who invented the electric light bulb? The first person to generate light from a wire filament was the British Sir Humphrey Davy. Davy was known for his work on electric arc lamps in the early 1800s. And his breakthrough discovery was the first electric light. His lamp used a very thin piece of platinum wire that had high resistance and emitted a soft glow. The lamp didn't last long, and so it was not practical, but it did pave the way for others. How do metal detectors work? Built into the frame of a metal detector are coils of wire that carry a current. When metal is close to the coils, the magnetic properties of the metal change the current in the coils of wire that is detected by the electronic circuits in the detector. When you walk through a metal detector with metal anywhere on your person, that metal changes the current in the coils in the frame of the detector. Is light a wave or a particle? Light, and other forms of electromagnetic radiation, has the properties of both a particle and a wave. As a wave it is described by its wavelength, frequency, amplitude, and polarization. It has the ability to diffract and interfere. As a particle it has energy, momentum, and angular momentum. It has the ability to be emitted and absorbed and to scatter off other particles, transferring energy and momentum. In some experiments it acts like a wave in part of the experiment and a particle in other parts. For example, if you put a beam of light through a pair of narrow, closely spaced slits. The so-called Young two-slit experiment, you get an interference pattern with alternating stripes of light where the light through the two slits constructively interferes, and darkness where the interference is destructive. If you now greatly reduce the intensity of the light and use a detector that can detect individual photons you will have regions where a large number of photons arrive and others where none arrive. The regions are exactly where the dark and light stripes were. If the intensity is so low that there is only one photon in the apparatus at a time how can the dark and light regions be understood? Particles can't split, with half going through one slit. Half through the other so the two halves interfere. If you try to modify the experiment so you can tell through. 
which slit the photon came you destroy the interference pattern. Physicists have grappled with this mystery for decades. There are no easy explanations. Perhaps the fault lies with our language and thinking. We simply do not have the correct words or mental concepts to describe and understand how light works. Why are electromagnets, the kind that pick up junk cars, so strong? An electromagnet is a coil of current carrying wire. Wound on an iron core that is at the center of an iron cup. The magnetic field created by current in the wire is strengthened by the iron core. The strength of the magnetic field produced by such electromagnets creates a large force. As described by the Lorentz force law that allows people to more easily move large metal objects. Such as steel cars, from one location to another. What is a watt? A watt is the unit of power, or the rate of energy transfer. Light bulbs, toasters, hair dryers, televisions, and other electrical appliances are rated by the power they use. In the context of electricity, the watt is the unit for electrical power and is often found on light bulbs and other devices used in electrical circuits. The formula to find the power used is P equals IXVT power equals current times voltage. How do earbuds use the results of electromagnetism? An earbud contains a membrane made out of thin plastic. In the center of the membrane is a coil of wire called the voice coil. The coil fits in a cylindrical slot in a permanent magnet. The center rod of the magnet is one pole, the outside tube is the other. Resulting in a magnetic field perpendicular to the wire. When there is a current through the wire the Lorentz force on the wire pushes the membrane in and out. The membrane exerts forces on the air molecules producing the longitudinal waves constituting sound. Refer to the sound chapter for more information. How are magnetic materials used in computers? Magnets are used in the compact motors that turn the discs in the CD or DVD. Drive and that move the laser that reads the disc to the correct position. Motors rotate the discs in a hard drive. The arm on which the read slash write head is mounted is rotated to the correct. Portion of the hard drive disc has a coil of wire on it in a magnetic field. When there is a current through the wire the force moves the arm to the correct position. The disc itself is often made of aluminum coated with an extremely thin 10 to 20 nanometers film of magnetic material that is divided into 
submicrometer-thick regions that are perpendicular to the surface of the disk. Each region is magnetized one way to represent a one and another way to represent at zero a tiny coil in the reed slash right head carries the current that magnetizes the regions. Does light interact with an atom as a wave or a particle? A wave carries energy continuously over time. The more energy in the wave, the faster the energy is transferred. A particle, on the other hand, delivers its energy all at once. When an atom either absorbs or emits light, the transfer is almost instantaneous. Therefore light interacts with an atom like a particle. The idea that light comes in packets of energy was first stated by Albert Einstein. 1879-1955, in 1905. He called the packet a light quantum. The quantum was given the name photon in 1926. The photon has no mass or charge. But it does carry angular momentum. It always moves at the speed of light, see. Each photon carries an amount of energy E equals HF, where Fis its frequency. Therefore a photon of blue light has more energy than one of red light. The energy carried by a beam of light depends both on the frequency and the number of photons per second leaving the source. How much resistance do our bodies have to electrical current? On average, the human body has an electrical resistance between 50,000 and 150. 000 ohms. Most of this resistance is across the skin. If the skin is wet the resistance drops to about 1,000 ohms. If the skin is broken, then resistance across organs in the body is on the order of a few hundred ohms. In this condition 10 volts is sufficient to cause serious, if not fatal damage. Are there different names for auroras in the northern and southern hemispheres? An aurora in the Northern Hemisphere, known as the Northern Lights, is officially called Aurora Borealis. While an aurora in the Southern Hemisphere, or Southern Lights, is called the Aurora Australis. How did probability rather than certainty enter into the model for the atom? In 1926 the Austrian physicist Erwin Schrödinger, 1887-1961, published an equation for a wave function that describes the probability of finding an electron at a particular position. It agrees with Bohr's model in that the most probable radius for an electron is that given by the Bohr model and the energy of the electron is the same as Bohr calculated. But its results are fundamentally different. The solution of Schrödinger's equation can be shown as a probability. 
cloud that shows the most probable locations for the electron. The n equals 1 state of the hydrogen atom is small and spherical. There are two n equals. Two states. The s state has angular momentum 0 and another spherically symmetric cloud. The p state, with angular momentum 1 has two most probable locations, the top and bottom. The n equals 3 state has three possible angular momenta, 0, 1, and 2 the d state. With angular momentum equals 2, has four angular regions with high probability. Red light is emitted when the electron goes from the n equals 3p state to the n equals 2s state. The lifetime of the higher energy state is very short, less than one billionth of a second. So when many atoms emit the light, the energy they emit is spread out. The energy from any particular atom cannot be precisely predicted. Are electrons waves or particles? The electrons in an atom are not confined to one region of space, but are spread out. They are acting more like waves than particles. In Louis de Broglie's 1892-1987-1924 doctoral thesis he proposed that electrons behave like waves with a wavelength given by x equals h slash mv. Where h is Planck's constant, and m and v the mass and velocity of the electron. The thesis was forwarded to Einstein, who enthusiastic ally endorsed the idea and recommended that the thesis be approved. De Broglie was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1929 for this work. The de Broglie wavelength is associated with any particle. Although for an object the size of a baseball it is much smaller than the diameter of a nucleus. The de Broglie wavelength of a particle determines its wave-like properties. Just as light photons interfere with themselves in a two-slit experiment, so do particles. The interference of electrons, atoms, and even molecules as large as C60, so-called buckyballs has been observed, and the measurements fit de Broglie's wavelength perfectly. So, both matter and light can act like either a particle or a wave. This phenomenon is given the name wave-particle duality. Why is a 100 watt bulb brighter than a 25 watt bulb? A light bulb transforms electric energy first into the thermal energy of the heated filament and then into light and heat. The rate at which these energy changes occur is determined by the way the bulb is constructed. The 100 watt bulb has a lower resistance filament the thin wire in the bulb that gets hot. Assuming that both bulbs are connected to a 120 volt outlet. There will be more current through the 100 watt bulb than the 25 watt bulb. Lower resistance is created by making the filament out of thicker wire. The lower resistance means higher current, which in turn means higher power and more light and heat output. Are emission and absorption the only ways light interacts with an atom?
In 1917 Albert Einstein proposed a third way light could interact with an atom. If a photon with the correct energy struck an atom in the excited state then the atom would be stimulated to emit an additional photon and drop to the lower energy level. The two photons leave with the same energy, in terms of a wave same wavelength, and in phase. What are maglev trains? Maglev, or magnetically levitated trains, are different from conventional trains in that they use electromagnetic forces to lift the cars off the track and propel them along thin magnetic tracks. Some demonstration trains have reached speeds of 500 km per hour, 300 miles per hour. Although the United States has no maglev train, nor an active research program in this technology. Germany and Japan have conducted a great deal of research in the field. What contribution did Thomas Edison make to the electric light? The American inventor Thomas Alva Edison, 1847-1931 Tried literally hundreds of different materials as filaments for the lamp. He found that heating a cotton thread in the air left a thin length of almost pure carbon. The carbon filament was connected to wire sealed in a glass bulb from which the air was removed. In 1878 this first practical electric lamp lasted for hours more than any other lamp. Why do electricians work with one hand behind their back? When working on high voltage circuitry, many electricians like to place one hand behind their back because this way there is little chance for each hand to touch objects of different electrical potentials and cause a shock. What are the two main forms of maglev transportation? The German system uses the attractive forces between electromagnets to lift the underside of the train 15 centimeters, 6 inches, above its guide rail. The coils in the train and guide rail form a linear motor like an ordinary motor that has been unrolled. The only commercial operation is a train in China that transports people 30 kilometers in slightly over 7 minutes. The Japanese have taken a slightly different approach toward maglev technology. The track and train repel each other. Propulsion also uses a linear motor. Levitation works well at high speeds, but when starting and stopping traditional wheels must be used. What is a spectrum and what are continuous and line spectra? Newton showed that when white light is passed through a prism it 
is split into a spectrum of all colors from violet through red. There were no gaps between the colors, so the spectrum is called continuous. The emission line of sodium has only two yellow lines. Hydrogen has four lines. The spectrum of iron, on the other hand, has an extremely large number of lines. An absorption line spectrum occurs when the low density gas absorbs distinct colors, leaving dark gaps in the otherwise continuous spectrum. For example, the spectrum that the German physicist Joseph von Fraunhofer 1787 to 1826 took of the spectrum of the sun in 1814 showed 574 dark lines. In 1859 they were explained as being absorption lines from the cooler gases in the sun's atmosphere. Fraunhofer made the best optical glass of any glassmaker of his era. He made great improvements to the achromatic lens which refracts light of all colors the same amount. Like most glassmakers of his era, he died young. Most likely from the poisonous effects of the materials used to make the glass. What is the difference between a motor and a generator? In each device, a magnet and a coil of wire are employed to change one form of energy into another form. A motor consists of multiple loops of wire placed in a magnetic field. Either the loops or the magnet can rotate. The current through the wires in the field causes a force that results in rotation and thus mechanical energy. Motors in a home are used in fans, hair dryers, and food processors. There are over a hundred motors in a modern automobile. The starter motor is the largest and most powerful. A generator does the opposite of a motor, it changes mechanical to electrical energy. But still consists of multiple loops of wire in a magnetic field. Either the loops or the magnet can rotate. In an automobile, a form of a generator, called an alternator, uses some of energy from the engine to charge the battery. Backup generators use the energy from a gasoline engine to produce enough electrical energy. To keep some of the lights and appliances running in a house when the electrical power fails. Electric utilities use huge generators to provide power for a city or larger area. The generators get their energy from steam turbines. The heat required to turn water into steam can come from coal, oil, natural gas, or nuclear burners. Wind power uses generators turned by the propeller blades. In what ways do atoms emit and absorb light? In the mid-1800s Robert Kirchhoff published three laws that describe how materials emit and absorb light. 1. A hot solid or a hot, dense gas produces a continuous spectrum. 2. A hot, low-density gas produces an emission line spectrum. 3. A continuous spectrum source viewed through a cool. Low-density gas produces an absorption line spectrum. <laughs>